But you notice how Jesus starts going into the we know? Yeah. Isn't that funny? I was just about to comment on Go that. ahead, you comment. No, I just I think it's fascinating that he's pulling from the Old Testament by saying we and our because it's God the Father that's speaking with Jesus and mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. And he's essentially saying that the Pharisees don't believe the Old Testament prophecies regarding what's standing right in front of him. Right. Just by saying a different pronoun. It's incredible. It's beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It's kind of like Nick came to him with this we know. And Jesus, very, this is not, you know, again, I thought for years I used to read this with, with an attitude, like, yeah, get him, Jesus. And it's not like that at all. He's just loving him. He's loving on him so much and saying, let me tell you what we know. And he's speaking on behalf of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Let me tell you what we know. We know, in a similar way you do, we've seen, we've heard, but spiritually. This is something over here. And what I'm sharing with you is the way it is on earth. These, I'm telling you about earthly things. I can't even begin to get into heavenly things because you're not even getting it here about the earthly things I'm talking about. So we can't engage in the heavenly. If you were born anew, you would be able to see and enter into the kingdom of God, these things. The ladder, up and down. When he says to him, when he uses the word how, it's not a put down. I thought for years it was. And then when you get to know the Lord better, you realize, no, I wasn't putting him, I wasn't putting him down. I was trying to show him how he believes, how he processes things. That how doesn't work in the kingdom. That's all he was saying to him. Your how is not going to get it done. So he's like pulling it out of him. It's almost like with Mary. Remember when she says they've run out of wine? And he's kind of looking at her and saying, so what does that have to do with us? Come on. Come on, spit it out. What does that have to do with us? And Mary could have said, we can change the situation? Yes, we can. Very good, Mary. <laughs> You believe that we could bring light into this situation and actually transform water into wine. With Nicodemus here, your how is not going to work. So how is this going to work, Nicodemus? It's almost like he's dragging it out of him for Nicodemus to say, I just need to receive what you're saying and believe it. Yes, because all I'm saying is what the prophets have foretold. This is not a new teaching. This has been right under your nose all along, but you've been, you're so fascinated with the external that you haven't begun to embrace the internal, the new heart, the new spirit, the new birth, any of that. And then we get to verse 14, which is about the cross. Somebody want to read verse 14? That's our last verse for tonight. You say, you haven't even talked about the cross yet. Well, everything that we've said has led to verse 14. As, Mo <laughs> As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now that, he has brought Nicodemus back to something that even Nicodemus can't say, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Because now he's brought him back to an event in Numbers 21. This whole conversation that's been taking place with the light and the dark, the heavenly, the earthly, the whole thing. Jesus brings it all together and says, Nick, this is what I'm talking about. Read verse 14 one more time. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Three times in John's Gospel, Jesus talks about being lifted up. This is the first time where he talks about, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent, the brazen serpent in the wilderness, which Nick would have been totally, totally clued up on more than we are here. <laughs> I mean, we could probably each one of us tell that story as we remember it from Numbers. Remember, Pharisees memorized 
the first five books of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Memorized it. So Nick could have at that moment gone back. Mind you, they hadn't broken down chapters and verses, but let's say they had. He could have gone back to Numbers 21 and verbatim said what was written in Numbers about what Jesus just quoted. That would have been a fascinating scenario. Because what Jesus has just said to him, as you know that story, as you remember it, and you think about what happened, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. So, for our sake, it's good to know what Jesus is talking about, because it's his first reference to the cross. And he's referring back to something that happened in the wilderness with Moses. It's not even the event that Jesus wants to highlight. In verses 15 through 17, it's almost like the Magna Carta of our faith. In John 3, verses 15, 16, 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That is really where Jesus has been trying to get to all along. Is that if you're majoring on externals, you can't receive that message. But if you're majoring on externals and you see the cross, that's the message that you should be seeing and receiving from the cross. For Nicodemus, we might say, because we've, we've just quoted that scripture so many times and we know God is love because John told us and all that. You know, and the, we're like there. Nicodemus is not. There was a man who's walking in darkness and he really doesn't know that God is love. To what extent? To what extent does he love? How much? Because that's the central message of the cross. The central message of the cross is one of, when you look at the cross, you see man's judgment. And I'm not talking just condemnation. I'm talking about judgment. The way we judge situations, the way we judge people, the way we crucify people. And that's what Numbers 21 is about. Numbers 21 actually has to do with when they were in the wilderness. They were mumbling and groaning, moaning quite a bit. They get to a point where they're um, attacked by an enemy. And God delivers them from the enemy. And they name the place, this is in Numbers 21, they name the place where God delivered them from their enemy. They name, them, they name it Horma, which actually means like to adore, to consecrate yourself to God. In other words, they did the same thing that we do. God does something for us and it's like, oh God, I'll never do that again. Oh God, I love you. Oh God, I'll, like we sang tonight. Every breath that I take. Well, that's, what do you mean every breath that you take? We mean it when we say, we really do mean that. But let's be honest, every breath that we take is not like that. When the words are coming out of our mouths that we shouldn't be speaking, when we're saying things, when we're doing things, that is not stuff that's consecrated to God. But God's not picking on us and saying, well, what a bunch of spiritual wimps you are. He doesn't do that. What happens in the wilderness as he delivers them, they consecrate themselves to, them, to him, and all of a sudden the journey gets tough, and it says they got discouraged. I could venture to say that all of us in here could give a good message and preach a good sermon on discouragement, the things that we've been discouraged by. <laughs> I, we really could. If we could receive the message that says, you know what? God loves you. In your discouragement, and I don't get it, I don't understand it, because I'm operating from a place that, you know, but God really, really loves you. Now, you're either going to believe that, or you're going to try to work it out in the darkness. Well, I don't see it. Of course you don't, because you're in the dark. In the wilderness, in, in Numbers 21, they start complaining against God and against Moses in their discouragement. So do you remember the story God sends it's called fiery serpents. They're not serpents of fire. That just means that he sends these serpents into the camp. And the serpents start biting the people. And the people start dying. 
So the Israelites run to Moses. And they say, Moses, Moses, please intercede for us to God on our behalf. And Moses does. And God tells Moses to take a pole to make a serpent of bronze. And that color, that bronze, the Hebrew word actually means the color of a de- or the cover of color of a snake's throat. That's what the word comes from. Put it on a pole, stand it up in front of the people, and when they look at the serpent, those who do shall be healed. And Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, as Moses did that in the wilderness, so shall it be with the Son of Man. We look at it and we say those serpents represented the words that the people were speaking. They were killing themselves with their words, Mm -hmm. with the words of a serpent's throat, so to speak. So make a serpent, put it on a pole. He became sin for us on the cross. And if we will look at our sin, if we will look, we will see two things. We will see what we've done to ourselves. You know, we can go on and on about the devil, and he certainly paid, played a part. But our problems have basically been our own that we've created. And if we can admit that and look at it, and then say, so God's going to kill us for it. No, God's going to die for it. He's going to die for you. He's not asking you to go on, a, go on a cross. He's honest with you that our Christian walk does involve suffering. But he's not asking us to be crucified. You see, the, the cross becomes an amazing place. It becomes this place of looking at what we do to each other. We crucify each other with our words. We kill ourselves. And all, all Jesus is saying is if you just look at that, and say, that's true. So what do I have to do? Just admit it. And receive my love. That picture, what Jesus was saying, was everything I've told you, Nick, is so true. But the only way you're ultimately going to be able to comprehend it, because darkness doesn't comprehend it, is by... The cross by look not and you're not going to the cross. I am, because what the cross is going to reveal is a message that you don't receive in darkness. For God so loved the world, He didn't. In fact, we should probably read it. Verses 15, 16, and 17 in John 3. That whoever believes in that whoever believes may in Him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. And the word word judge there means to condemn. He's not coming in and condemning us for what we've done. We've already condemned ourselves, and that's what the passage goes on to say. We've done a good job. He doesn't have to come in and condemn us anymore. We've condemned ourselves. We nailed an innocent man to a cross just to get him out of the way so we can continue to devour ourselves. And if we can look at that, this is just, like I say, I've got a whole bunch of stuff in my heart about the cross. We look at that and the message of God's love. See, his judgment is not to get back at us. His judgment is to save us by loving us. That's one of the central messages of the cross. The interesting thing about this brazen serpent, you may or may not remember, hundreds of years later, hundreds of years later, there's a revival under King Hezekiah's reign. And Hezekiah is ripping down altars and high places and everything. He's bringing... Revival and restoration to the nation of Israel. And one of the things he does is he takes the brazen serpent that they've been carrying around for hundreds of years. You know, you wonder, what happened to that thing? Well, they've been carrying it around. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Mm. And they've been worshiping in front of it. Mm. 
and burning incense to it. They even gave it a name. And Hezekiah takes it and destroys it. He breaks it in pieces. Now, I'm not trying to be funny about it, but, I mean, maybe some of us in here, I have, gone into churches and looked around and said, where's the cross? Where's the cross? I've seen people wearing crosses around their necks. And what's coming out of their mouth is far from godly. But they got a cross around their neck. Whether Jesus is on it or not, it's not the point. Hezekiah actually saw where that was getting in the way of people actually receiving the message of the cross. In other words, once you've received and we've believed, I'm not saying that there's no place for the cross. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that there was another side to the cross that Jesus majors on. He doesn't come back and talk about the cross. He comes back and talks about the Spirit. He comes back and talks about a resurrected life. And he doesn't talk about the cross. You've already been there. You've acknowledged. It served its purpose. So can we please move on? We'll move on next week with the cross.